it's probably worth pausing first to say what inerrancy isn't. Uh, some people want inerrancy to include, for example, no grammatical irregularities or no strange spellings. Whereas, uh, to be quite frank, we in the West are only coming to standardized spelling fairly recently. Just take a look at the Puritan spelling of 400 years ago, and it was bizarrely uh, varied and so forth. It doesn't have anything to do with picky details of that sort. Nor does it address the question whether or not the manuscripts were copied and copied and copied, and therefore sometimes it, you get copyists making mistakes. It doesn't address any of that sort of question. It's finally tied to one central issue. Has God disclosed himself in words or only in numinous experiences? If he's disclosed himself in somehow subjective, mystical, numinous experiences that can't be verbalized accurately, um, then any notion of inerrancy or the like just makes no sense. But if God, in his mercy, talks to us, if he's a talking God in our language, despite the fact that he inhabits eternity, he speaks to us in Hebrew and in Aramaic and Greek, the languages of the biblical periods, um, then the question becomes, are his words reliable? When he speaks, does he speak the truth? Now, obviously, the, the Bible is made up of many different literary forms, different literary genres, for example. And so sometimes the way God discloses himself uh, are very different from other ways that God discloses himself, even in words, for example. Um, through the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament, about six centuries before Christ, uh, God gives Jeremiah certain words, and Jeremiah dictates them to his secretary, and his secretary writes them down. Now, as part of the story, eventually some bad guys come along and they pick up the manuscript, the only manuscript, and they start tearing it up and throwing it into the fire. Now, if you're a reader of that, you're supposed to laugh because, after all, this wasn't a PhD dissertation by Jeremiah. God gave this to Jeremiah. Do you really think God's forgotten what he said? And so God gives it to Jeremiah again. Um, so here's, here's just plain dictation. But in other passages, uh, Psalm 23, which many of us grew up with, David can say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. Now, he wasn't given that by dictation. He was expressing his own feelings, his own understandings from his own days as a shepherd boy. and He just thought this was a terrific analogy to talk about God. Now, in both cases, God used human individuals, in some cases by um, dictation, in other cases by visions and the like, in this case through the experiences of David, to produce a text that is simultaneously the text of the human writer and God's own ordained, providentially determined words. And the question is, is this God a, a truth-speaking God? Now, of course, there's lament, and you don't ask the first question about lament, is it telling the truth? But insofar as there is a truth claim in the material, then inerrancy is merely a way of saying that wherever there is a truth claim, in fact, God's words are true. That's all it is. Now, you could also say uh, there are other categories. Um, is the Bible uh, emotionally evocative? Yes, it is. Uh, is it uh, hugely symbol-laden? In some kinds of writing, hugely so, because it's made up of so many different kinds. In other words, truth is not the only standard to bring up against scripture. But because it's the standard that is so often denied in today's world, therefore you find confessing Christians wanting to affirm it using a variety of words. And inerrancy is simply one of those words to insist that where scripture purports to be telling you stuff, God's words are reliable. They tell the truth. They don't make mistakes. God knows what he's doing. That's what inerrancy is about.